As you're seated this morning, do me a favor and do not turn to the book of Acts. Turn instead to the book of Mark, okay? Turn with me to the gospel of Mark, the second gospel, chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. As you can tell from my gigantic shirt, which is way too big for my skinny little body, it's VBS this week, as you've heard from James. Didn't they do a fantastic job up here? And praise God for this. And by the way, Wayne, I'm sorry. I know you're just jealous because you didn't get one of these, man. I am loved. What can I say? Now, as we think about VBS this week, that means opportunities for the gospel. That's what really excites me. And I hope that excites you as well. A wide open door to reach kids and their families on behalf of Christ. And we're just coming off of basketball camp, another one of those significant ministries, one of the most important ministries we do all year, where we had many occasions to preach Jesus and the good news of God's salvation. And these ministries excite me. As we say with Paul, we preach Jesus the Lord and Savior, praying for souls to be saved because we too are not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now yesterday I was reading through Mark chapter 4. I'm reading through the New Testament again. And I came upon a parable that I've actually been thinking about for some time, but I read it again. And as I read it, I thought, i got to read this to all of you because it's really been on my heart and it so much encouraged me. Mark chapter 4 verses 26 to 29. And no, this isn't going to be the sermon today. I just want to briefly mention this as a hop, skip, and a jump on the way to Acts 26 this morning. Here's a kingdom parable. Jesus is speaking and he was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil and goes to bed at night and gets up by day and the seed sprouts up and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. It's a simple parable. It's teaching us about the kingdom of God. A farmer plants the seed, he goes home, he goes to sleep. Isn't it amazing how Jesus can take the most significant of truth and put it in such understandable, clear, simple ways. But as the farmer is sleeping, the seed sprouts up and the seed grows. How? Jesus says he does not know. It is not due to his expertise. It is not due to his great skill. He just does the simple tasks and he goes to bed. It's that easy. He has no influence over the outcome. In fact, the results are a mystery to him, says Jesus. And the point is obvious. Our job is to faithfully scatter the seed of the gospel far and wide wherever you go, like good farmers for Christ. But God brings all the results. And he does it often in surprising and mysterious ways. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but what? But God caused the growth. God did it. We plant, we water, but God brings the increase. He causes fruit. He causes sleep while we simply go to uh, salvation, while we simply go to bed to sleep. And how encouraging that is to me. In light of all the gospel ministry we've had this summer, in light of VBS this week, how encouraging it is. We don't need to be stressed over the results. Plant and water and go to bed and leave the results to God. Yesterday, um, I was with my brother David out in uh, Lakeview Terrace about an hour from here with uh, our friend Ken Zutel. We did our creation evolution play. I ended with the gospel, which is really the joy uh, for us of that play that we get to end with the good news of God's glorious salvation through Christ. It was late. I usually get to bed by 8 o'clock on Saturday night. 
I drove the hour home to Camarillo. I prayed with Donna and the kids, and I went to bed. And I tell you, Mark 4 was on my mind as I went to bed last night. I literally applied it. All those people that I got to preach the gospel to last night, they're in God's hands as well as any fruit that he bears through the planting of the scriptures, through the planting of the gospel. So relax, plant, trust God, go to sleep. It's wonderful, it's encouraging. And praise God when we wake up and we see surprising fruit. And then all the glory goes to him. We had nothing to do with it. From basketball camp or VBS or a creation evolution play or personal evangelism, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. So trust in the Lord to bring the fruit and go to sleep, go to bed, and rest peacefully. Now with that in mind, turn over with me to Acts chapter 26. Is God mighty to save? Can we trust him to do the remarkable, the mysterious, the extraordinary, the surprising? There is no greater evidence of the power of God and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no greater evidence than Paul's testimony, the greatest conversion in all of history, the foremost of sinners saved by Jesus Christ. I've entitled our sermon, A Testimony Before a King. Because you remember, Paul is before an audience that has King Agrippa and Governor Festus and all of these great civic and military dignitaries. Paul is going through his salvation story in Acts chapter 26. To say it again, it's the third time we get it in the book of Acts. It's obviously significant enough for Luke to take three of 28 chapters to give us this story. It is the most significant conversion in all of history, and that's why we're taking the time as we are with it. There's a sermon outline in your bulletins. I encourage you to take notes. We're going to be all over today, and you'll see many of the passages and points in your sermon notes. Now we're under letter C. Paul confirms the gospel. It's a lengthy section, verses 1 to 23. And last week then we said Paul is giving his testimony. And you know that if you're going to give your testimony, you have to tell people what your life was like before Christ. And that's what Paul does. Notice, as we saw last week under point one, Paul's career before Christ. In verses 1 through 11, he reminded us he was a zealous Jew He was more committed in his day than any of his fellow Jews. He was a scrupulous Pharisee, committed to the law of God, but guess what? He was dead in his religion. He was dead. He was lost. He hated Jesus Christ. He did not accept Christ as his Messiah. He hated Christians. His goal, his ambition in life was to destroy the church. He could not get to Jesus, and so he persecuted his followers. Wherever he could find them, he would hunt them down. He would press on them, persecute them, call on them, try to force them to blaspheme Jesus Christ. And if they would not, then he would murder them. Imagine that. This great man, this greatest Christian, I believe, in all of history. Those were the B.C. days. That was Paul before Jesus Christ. And then we started last time in point number two, Paul's conversion and commission by Christ in verses 12 to 18. We saw, we remember the familiar story. He says, I was so zealous hunting down Christians. I wasn't content to just stay in Jerusalem. I was going to follow them wherever I could find them, even to foreign cities, and one of them was the city of Damascus. And on the road to Damascus, with the authority of the chief priests acting on their behalf as their attack dog to exterminate the church, he meets the risen, glorious Lord Jesus Christ. In verses 12 to 15, We read his testimony while thus engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests at midday, O king, remember he's talking to King Agrippa here, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. 
And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And then for this morning, look at verses 16 to 18. But arise, says Jesus the Lord, but arise and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Wow. You got to say that. Wow. What a glorious passage. There's so much for us here. There's instruction for us. There's encouragement. And I want to go slowly now as we continue in our passage. So let's notice together the various elements of Christ's words to Paul on this Damascus road in verse 16. First notice, letter A. Jesus says to him, but arise and stand on your feet. Get up because, Paul, you've got work to do now. For the Lord Jesus who's sending you, that's the idea. Jesus knocks Paul down, humbles him, converts him, and now he picks Paul back up to commission him and send him. And as I read this passage, Jesus' command to Paul, I was reminded it it parallels the commissioning of an Old Testament prophet by the name of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 1, and that's a difficult passage to translate, by the way, and to interpret as well. But in Ezekiel chapter 1, the prophet of God tells us that he has these great visions of God Almighty. He sees the glory and he sees the majesty of God. And then Ezekiel falls on his face and he hears a voice speaking to him. And here's what is mentioned then to him. Here's the message. Ezekiel chapter 2. Verses 1 to 3, as the narrative of Ezekiel continues, Then he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Then he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, to a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. Ezekiel, stand on your feet. I am sending you to Israel with my message. And so with Paul, sent now to the Jews, yes, but also to the Gentiles with Christ's message. And then as verse 16 continues, the Lord Christ tells Paul that he has appeared to Paul to appoint him, to designate him, to commission him. And what is that going to entail? Notice letter B. Paul is an appointed minister, says the Lord Jesus. Now, what is a minister? I get called that a lot as a pastor. Not as much. Usually people call me a pastor, but also a minister. Occasionally, reverend. I remember that in Florida. A minister is a servant. In fact, the original meaning of hupe retes was a third-level galley slave. In other words, on the lowest deck of the ship, the slaves at the lowest level rowing away. Those were the huperetes. And Paul exalts to call himself that. A third level galley slave. That's what I am. A slave for Jesus Christ. Now, who does Paul serve? Turn back with me to Acts chapter 20 and let me just remind you how he rejoiced to have this role on behalf of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 20, starting at verse 17, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, 
and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, ultimately, he serves the Lord, Jesus Christ. But that service meant faithful ministry to both Christians and non-Christians. It was a ministry of sacrifice and suffering involving persecution and opposition, involving deprivation. It was a ministry, says Paul, of trials and tears as he preached repentance to the unbeliever, as he established his gospel converts in the faith, declaring to them anything that was profitable, that's how he served the Lord Jesus Christ. He was an appointed minister. But also he was, notice letter C, an appointed witness. And what a glorious calling this is. Luke pulls both of these roles together in Luke chapter 1, verse 2, where he speaks of those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, the gospel, handing down their accounts to us. So go back then to verse 16 of chapter 26. What is a witness? An eyewitness, that's the answer. One who simply reports what he has seen, what he has experienced. Let's not make this too difficult. And that's why we as Christians, have you noticed, we often refer to evangelism as witnessing, don't we? There's nothing wrong with that. That's what we're doing. We're telling people what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've experienced of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. I know him. Whereas I was blind, now I see. I know that I met the Lord Jesus when I was 15 years old. I know that on that day, it was crystal clear that I could no longer try to serve my lusts and Jesus at the same time, and God wonderfully saved me. Jesus came to me and met me and transformed me. And I'm an eyewitness then, and I, I witness of what Jesus has done. And that simplifies everything. A witness gives a testimony. And so we tell others what we've experienced and what we know to be true about Jesus Christ. Now Paul, of course, in his calling is unique because, you see, he's an apostle. He will carry Christ's authority as one who has actually seen the risen Christ and been commissioned by the Lord to be his authoritative representative to the church and to the world. I've met Jesus, but I've never seen him but I love him and I trust in him and I know I'm going to see him. And one day, like we read in Colossians 3, all of us are going to be revealed in glory with Christ Jesus. But Paul has this unique calling. He sees the risen Lord Jesus and now he goes out as the apostle to the Gentiles with Christ's authority and power behind him to preach as an eyewitness. Now, before I leave this point, I want to remind you that this word witness, martyra, it's the Greek word from which we get our word martyr, martyr. That's a fascinating word because you see a martyr was originally just a witness. Just a witness, that's all. But so many witnesses were killed as they testified of Jesus Christ. They were murdered as they stood for Christ. That to be a witness in time meant to be a martyr, meant to give your life on behalf of Christ. Killed for your testimony, that's a martyr. One who dies for his faith, dies for her faith. And today we have that ministry, the voice of the martyrs. And that's happening today. People are dying for their faith today. I've never even been scratched for my faith. I've had people look at me in funny ways. I've had people call me names. I've even had people threaten me, though they'd never followed through on it. But our brothers and sisters around the world are dying for their faith. They are martyrs for Jesus Christ. 
And the voice of the martyrs keeps the church informed about all the persecutions and sufferings of our brothers and sisters around the world as they witness and die in so many cases for Christ. As I thought about that, I wanted to ask you a question that I asked myself this last week. Have you ever thought about the fact that God may ask you one day to be a martyr on behalf of Jesus Christ? Do you ever think about that? Have you ever considered that maybe before you and I are done, before we go home, that God may ask us to give our lives on behalf of Christ? That we may be called by God to show to the world that we value Jesus Christ even more than life itself? And if the choice comes down to denying Christ or dying, well, we choose death because to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, that is so foreign to us, isn't it? I look at you, we've never experienced it. We didn't pray for one person in our congregation this last week over the threat of death, did we? We don't hardly know anyone who is facing the threat of death. Maybe we read about such people, but God may very well call us to be martyrs for Christ, just like he did all of his apostles, including Paul who was beheaded, all of them except for John. And they tried to kill John, and they couldn't, according to church history. He died of old age, but not the rest of them. And notice in verse 16 the content of Paul's witness. It's letter D, things seen and that will be seen. But arise and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you. Paul will be an authoritative representative of the Lord Jesus, an eyewitness of the risen Christ, and he has to tell people what he's seen. And he's doing that. He's telling it to Agrippa. But there will be further additional revelations in the future to Paul, because Jesus, the risen Lord, will appear to him again and again, as we see in Acts, as he tells us in the epistles as he gives account of his life and ministry. There will be further revelations of the Lord's will. There will be additional manifestations of Christ's power to Paul and through Paul, all to undergird this man and to advance Paul's mission given to him by Jesus. And we saw such an appearance as recently as Acts 23. Turn back there. After Paul had been rescued by the Sanhedrin yet again by Claudius Lysias, who feared that Paul would be literally torn to pieces pretty graphic huh we are going to just rip this man to shreds we hate him that much claudius lysias has to swoop in and rescue paul and then in acts 23 11 we read but on the night immediately following the lord stood at his side and said take courage for as you have been solemnly witnessing to my cause at jerusalem so you must witness at Rome also. And that's, the, that's where we're at in the narrative. Paul's going to Rome by God's decree. Paul, you're not going to die in Jerusalem because I, the sovereign Lord, have determined I'm sending you on your next assignment to Rome. You're going to get there and be my witness there. And so the Lord stands at his side to encourage him and support him. Paul, I have further plans for you. You're not going to be murdered yet. There's more work to be done. Jesus will deliver him again and again. And by the way, when he gets to Rome, which is beyond the book of Acts, he will be delivered again. He will be set free. It won't be till later, after he wrote the book of 2 Timothy, that Paul was imprisoned again and finally beheaded and sent to his heavenly reward. And that brings us to letter, letter E. Notice with me. Rescuing and sending back in chapter 26. Both come together in Acts 26, verse 17, where Jesus says that what he's going to be doing is delivering you, Paul, from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. So Paul's ministry, we often forget, it wasn't just to the Gentiles. That was his predominant ministry. We know that. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. But he's also going to have a ministry to the Jews. In fact, to the Jew first, as a fellow Jew. When Paul went into a city, he looked for the synagogue. He would preach to the Jew first. And only when there was rejection 
then the gospel would move to the Gentiles. Jesus is sending Paul. The verb is apostello, from which the noun apostolos or apostle is derived. Paul is Christ's sent one. He is called to preach the good news of salvation from sin and eternal life in God's risen Son through faith in Jesus. But such a ministry, notice verse 17, it's going to face extreme hardship and fierce opposition and persecution and hatred. Imagine being called to that. Paul was told at the very beginning he would be a witness to God, to the Jews, to the Gentiles, to kings, and he would also be taught how much he would be called to suffer on behalf of Jesus Christ. His life was a perpetual suffering, a beating, a, a, a brokenness for Jesus Christ. And so Jesus in the midst of all of that, promises to be faithful in delivering Paul, rescuing him from both the Jews and Gentiles. So this is amazing. Think about this testimony. The former persecutor, Paul, will now be numbered among the persecuted. But even amidst that suffering, Christ will be Paul's sovereign protector. Even to the point when he brings him home to heaven. And Paul talks about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Listen to Paul's last letter and nearly the last words that he ever penned to the church. He's writing to Timothy, and in 2 Timothy 4, starting at verse 16, he says, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. We think, that's not fitting for this great man to be alone at the end of his life, deserted by his brothers and sisters in Christ. But that's what God called him to. But, verse 17, even though those who should have stood with me left me, they deserted me, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me in order that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. All may desert Paul but Jesus never will. He will stand with Paul and strengthen and empower Paul's witness until the day when the Lord will deliver Paul out of this world and bring him safely to the heavenly kingdom. Amen. Jesus will be with him. As we go back to Acts 26, now verse 18, the Lord Jesus promises not only to rescue Paul from danger, but also to accomplish great things through Paul and great things through his gospel ministry. Notice verse 18 again. Paul is sent by Christ to both Jew and Gentile to do this, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me." That is what the Lord is going to do through Paul. Isn't that remarkable? What an incredible verse. Let's unpack it slowly together through a question. Notice on your sermon outlines, what does God bring to us when he saves us? What does he do in us? What does he bring to us? Are you ready for this? Are you prepared to be encouraged? Seven wonderful truths from verse 18. Here's what God brings to you, what he brought to me when he saves us. First of all, letter A, enlightenment. That's what God does in us. Paul is sent to open their eyes through the gospel so that they may turn from darkness to light. Now in verse 13, Paul has seen the light literally. He has seen the resplendent, shining, glorious majesty of King Jesus. It's noon, as if to emphasize. That's the time when the sun is at its brightest. Guess what? The glory of Christ shines so much brighter than the noonday sun. There's no comparison. Paul knows immediately that he is in the presence of a supernatural Lord and then that Lord identifies himself as Jesus. So Paul sees the light. 
And he does so in order to now bring the light to others because they desperately need light. Now, as you think about this metaphor from Scripture, why? Why do unbelieving people need light? And the answer is because the Bible teaches that unbelievers live in oppressive spiritual darkness. That's the answer. Listen all the way back to the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 4, it's such a graphic verse, very clear. It says, the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Have you known people like that? I've known so many people like that. Even in my immediate family as I've watched my brothers and sisters walking apart from the Lord. It's one calamity and one disaster after another. One horrendous problem from sin leading to the next horrendous problem. And they come out of this hole and they fall into the next one. And your heart grieves for them, doesn't it? You want them to know Christ. They don't even know what they're stumbling over. It's a perpetual stumbling. And it's so sad. That's what Jesus came to deliver us from. A darkness that is so deep they don't even know what they're stumbling over. Tripping over something in the dark. You know it. You have kids, don't you? Well, some of you no longer, or maybe not yet, but there's always something around. There's always something by my table or in the middle of the living room. Matthew, Lizzie, and Faith have taken over the whole family room lately with Legos, and then all the other kids seem to get in on it. There's always stuff everywhere. And if you happen to venture out at night, look out, right? Well, that's what we're talking about. A continual stumbling in the darkness over sin after sin after sin they don't even know what they're tripping over they cannot see spiritual blindness and then the lord turns on the light through the gospel listen to the contrast in the prior verse in proverbs chapter 4 i love this imagery of verse 18 but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day The world is stumbling in perpetual darkness. Our pathway in Jesus is getting brighter and brighter and clearer and clearer until we get to heaven. Praise God for that. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 13 speaks of those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. In Isaiah 59, verses 9 and 10, that great prophet describes the wicked as walking in gloom, the wicked groping along the wall like blind men, stumbling at midday like dead men. Paul describes Christians elsewhere like this in Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 17, he says, This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they have become callous, giving themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Now here's the good news however dark it is and it is so dark apart from christ the good news is one of the glorious i am statements in john's gospel it's in john chapter 8 verse 12 again jesus spoke to them saying i am the what i am the light of the world he who follows me will not walk in the darkness but will have the light of life. Isn't that beautiful? If I follow Jesus, I will walk in the light, yes, because he is the light of the world. In John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the what? The light of men. In John 1, 5, and the light shines in the darkness. In John 1, 9, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man john 9 verse 5 while i am in the world says jesus i am the light of the world 
So when God saves us, then he opens our blind eyes to see the glory and beauty of Jesus, the light of the world. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter explains that in salvation, God calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then we became, at that point, proclaimers of his excellencies as the savior as the light giver the one who enlightens the one who illumines we are proclaimers of the excellencies of the god who calls us out of darkness into light this metaphor of light and contrasting darkness it's all throughout scripture in fact i was reminded this last week it's sprinkled through first john in those first couple chapters and you remember because this is one of those verses that has gripped me and i often pray it and this is the message says john in first john 1 5 this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that god is light and in him there is no darkness at all you can search and search And you will find no impurity in God's character. You will find nothing untrue. Only righteousness, only holiness, only justice. In 1 John 1, 6 and 7, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. You see, if you are fellowshipping with God and walking in the light, you're going to be like him. You can't walk in darkness and walk with God simultaneously. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. And then if you drop down into chapter 2 of 1 John, starting at verse 9, again, John picks up this theme of light and dark. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. Many will make profession. They know Jesus, but if there's no practice of love, well, they're still in the dark. Verse 10, the one who loves his brother abides, lives in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. There it is again. And then verse 11, but the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. God is light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. To know and fellowship with God in Christ is to walk in the light, being delivered from the darkness that blinds the eyes. And then, as receivers of light who walk in the light, we are to be light reflectors to the world, right? That's our calling now. To walk in the light and to reflect the light out into the world. The one who is the light of the world. He explains to us just like this. In the Sermon on the Mount, think about this. In Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under the peck measure, hide it under a bushel. No! Right? My kids know that. You know that. Hide it under a bushel? No, of course not. We're here to shine the light of God. Put it on the lampstand. It gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And then I want to read a lengthier passage to you. It's in Ephesians chapter 5 where Paul again picks up this very theme. If you want to turn there because it's verses 3 to uh, to 13. Ephesians 5, 3 to 13. Paul now writing to the Ephesians as new creatures in Christ, as the redeemed, as those who've been transformed by the gospel, he says, look, this is what that means now. Here's the Christ life, the negative and the positive. But do not let, verse 3, immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among saints. And saints means what? Saints means holy ones. There must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. Why? 
See, that's the command, right? That's the imperative. But Paul tells us why. Here's the indicative truth. Here's who you are. And because of who you are, that's how you have to live. Here's who you are, verse 8. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. There it is again. But instead even expose them. We do that by shining the light of Jesus Christ. As you shine the light, you will not be a participator. You will expose the darkness. Verse 12, Paul says, It is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light for everything that becomes visible is light. So Paul says, walk as children of light. That's your identity in Christ. Don't walk in immorality or impurity or filthiness. Don't walk in darkness, but in goodness and righteousness and truth. That's your identity. Don't join in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Expose them by the light, your light in Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul commands us to be blameless and innocent Children of God above reproach, he says this, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, listen, listen now, among whom you appear as lights in the world. So God has opened our eyes so that we can see the light and walk in the light, proclaim his greatness as the one who's called us out of darkness into light, and now he wants us to shine his light light in this world of unbelievers so that they can be rescued too now what does god bring us then when he saves us enlightenment that is such a beautiful picture in scripture praise god whereas i was blind now i see and then further letter b notice conversion that's also what god brings back to acts twenty six eighteen to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light in an unsaved world through paul's gospel ministry the lord will open their blind eyes so that they may turn that's conversion a turning a 180 we like to say sometimes christians get it all wrong they talk about a 360 that's not right you don't go all the way back around you turn the other way right it's a 180 not a 360 Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology says, conversion is our willing response to the gospel call in which we sincerely repent of sins and place our trust in Christ for salvation. So it's a turning from and a turning to, a turning from sin and a turning to Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith. And repentance is one of these beautiful words, metanoia, a change of mind, a turning from sin a sorrowful renunciation of my sin, a forsaking of it to now do Christ's will. Faith, what is that? Trust in Christ alone to save me from my sins. It's entering into a discipleship relationship, isn't it? In which I follow the Lord Jesus as master. Jesus, in verse 18, calls it a turning from darkness to light. Now listen to Paul's description of the Thessalonians' conversion. I always think of this when I think of conversion. Paul says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ knowing his choice of you our gospel didn't come to you in word only but in power of the holy spirit with full conviction you became imitators of us in, in the lord you received the word in much tribulation you became an example to all the believers of macedonia and achaia and he says this verse 9 for they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you how you turned to god from idols to serve a living and true god and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead that is jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come you turn from your false gods your idols to serve the living and true god and you were filled with hope you're awaiting the return of christ that is conversion
You know, last night at the play, I was thinking of my brother David last night. Before Christ, his life really revolved around two things, fast cars and fast music. That was it. That was his life. I knew him before Christ. He was a superb drummer in a rock band, did not know Jesus. He had the fastest car in Sun Valley like that even mattered, you know? Back then, everybody raced cars. Dave Weir, you're in that same generation. Did you have a fast car? You remember? I don't know. Okay. Guess what? David's idol was stolen out of the parking lot at Zodi's. Some of you don't even remember Zodi's. But God sent someone to steal his idol, and it just crushed him. He didn't have insurance. And he looked to the Lord, and he was saved. The amazing thing about my brother David, he was never much of a student. Now he comes to Christ, and he says, i got to go back to college. He starts Valley College. Some of you have been there. Not much of a college. He starts there. Guess what happens? He gets into a science class with a rabid evolutionist who attacks the Bible, attacks Christ, attacks God as creator. And now David finds his life work to defend God's word, to defend and exalt our creator, to exalt the Lord Jesus. And now several degrees later in paleoanthropology. Here's my brother David, a science teacher of high school students, a science teacher of college students. That is conversion. Praise God. And what else does God bring when he saves us? Letter C, liberation. You see, salvation is liberation, not liberation uh, uh, theology. We're not talking about communism now in a Christian garb. Liberation from the dominion of Satan, verse 18 of Acts 26. To open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan. Satan, do you realize that before Christ you were held captive by Satan to do his will? You served the devil, and I served the devil. There's no nice way to put that. People don't like that when I tell them that. You're serving the devil. You don't know God. If you haven't embraced Jesus Christ, you have been held captive by Satan to do his will. And salvation then, says Paul, is an escape from the snare of the devil. An escape from being held captive by him to do his will. An escape from enslavement to the devil. 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, says John. Salvation frees us from Satan's lordship over us and his dominion as the God of the world. And God gives us instead this, letter D, kingdom transfer. Kingdom transfer, verse 18. Because salvation is a turning from the dominion of Satan to the dominion of God, says Paul. The dominion of Satan to God. Now turn over with me to Colossians chapter 1. Because there's no question that what Jesus says to Paul is then right on Paul's mind as he writes Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. The parallels are many and various. Colossians chapter 1. Starting at verse 12, he talks about giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, for he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I want you to see these elements in this parallel passage. Keep Acts 26, 18 in mind. Do you see the same thing, themes here? Darkness, a domain, a, a kingdom of darkness ruled by the evil one, Satan, or the devil. Salvation is deliverance or liberation and being transferred by God to the kingdom of his beloved son, says Paul. And that means that you and I are under a new king now, King Jesus the King of all kings and Lord of all lords, the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Was that a difficult transfer? Do you look back and think, oh, I think I want to go under the old king? Never, never. We serve the one who's been exalted above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named in this age and in the one to come. And every knee is going to bow before King Jesus, and every tongue is going to confess him as Lord to the glory of God. That means you and I are in his kingdom now, and his earthly kingdom, Christ's rule of earth, well, that's coming up, and we're going to rule with him, and we have a lot to look forward to. 
Well, through the gospel, we, you and I, are extending Christ's kingdom as God saves sinners and delivers them from Satan's domain of darkness. And he puts them into the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, live then as kingdom citizens. That changes everything, doesn't it? That means when I go to work tomorrow, I'm representing the kingdom of God at Sony, right? I'm representing the kingdom of God at Q Corp or wherever you're going, whatever you're doing at VBS, right? I'm representing the very kingdom of God to my friends, in my family, on my neighborhood block. I am extending Christ's kingdom as a citizen of heaven. Bring glory to the king. Now, did you catch what Paul said in Colossians 1, 13 to 14? There is kingdom transfer and also letter E, forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins, verse 14. Jesus Christ, God's beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness is a beautiful picture. It is the releasing of a debt. Now, We've met people through the years. Wouldn't that be a dream come true? You know, I'm so far in debt. If only someone would just come and cancel it out. Well, that's what God does spiritually. This inestimable, infinite debt due to our sin, God just cancels it out. We are forgiven. How does he do that? Verse 16. Through Christ's redemption, Jesus pays the ransom price so that we can be delivered from sin's power and penalty through faith. Through faith in Jesus. We have been forgiven. And Paul rejoices in this. In Romans chapter 4, he's talking about Abraham and his salvation through faith apart from works. And Paul says in Romans 4, starting at verse 5, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. God justifies the ungodly. He declares wicked people to be righteous. How? He forgives them. How? He covers their sin. He doesn't take their sin into account. How? Christ's ransom. Christ's redemption. He paid for our sins. We are forgiven. And His righteousness is charged to our account, reckoned, imputed to us through faith. Through faith in Jesus. Praise God, we are forgiven. I'm looking at the time. There's one more thing we need to do at the end of the service. I hate to do this. I'm going to hear about this from Dave Weir. Okay, so Dave, I'm just confessing it right now. I didn't finish the outline. Forgive me. Dave doesn't do that. There is much here in our passage. I, I kind of am staggered to think I wanted to do the whole thing in one week. I'm praising God that we're going slower because God is working in my own heart through all of this. And I trust this will be a great encouragement to you too.